Wow, sure. So nervous today. Wow. Don't worry, Sean. You've got this. There's only 150 odd data subjects in front of you. Don't worry. In the next 15 seconds, we'll have tagged you and bagged you and monetized you. So yeah, that makes me feel better already. So, data subject, though, that is what you are, according to regulation, according to companies out there. Uh, personally, I think they could have chosen a better name. Uh, especially since the data protection regulation that's coming out in, in May is meant to stop people from analyzing your data and actually studying you, and yet we've made a subject out of us. So I wouldn't be much cooler if we had a name like Tron or Ray from Star Wars or something. You know, it could have been a Ray report versus a, a data protection report. So I think we'll have to challenge them around that one. I'm feeling much more less nervous now. Anyone in the audience nervous? You see people shaking their heads, not nervous. Well, you should be, actually. <laughs> yeah, you should. By 2025, each and every one of you will be analyzed and tagged and your data sent up to the internet 4,800 times per day. Okay, that's almost once every 18 seconds. And that is through your mobile, your social media, Internet of Things, and all this great technology that surrounds us. So we really do have to start thinking about our digital privacy and our digital lives before it gets away from us. So. For me, privacy is much like beauty. Uh, it's in the eye of the beholder. Some of us love it, some of us don't. Some of us don't really care, or we're a little bit lazy when it comes to privacy. However, when it comes to physical privacy, uh, we're very protective around our children, how much money we'll spend on protecting them, uh, especially on a train, for example, in Switzerland, if someone stares at you too long, which is a no-no, by the way, and you start feeling a little bit uncomfortable, uh, or if somebody starts following you on the way home and starts looking through your window, you know, we get quite sensitive about that type of privacy. Yet, when it comes to our online lives, and we uh, look at uh, social media every single day, we become apathetic, lazy, or sometimes even ignorant around our digital privacy. So that's what we're going to explore today and see what we can change in the future. Privacy though has been with us for, for centuries. Uh, it's, it's part of our cultures. It's actually found in ancient Rome and in ancient Greece. Uh, even in the Bible and the Quran, there's mentions of people desiring privacy. So why in this digital age are we treating it with less significance? What's most concerning to me though is that once we truly understand the value of our digital lives, we may have lost it forever. We are actually at that precipice of losing it forever if we don't take action. But hey, we all love our tools and our gadgets and our toys and our technology. So what we'll do is have a quick look at some of the cool technology out there that's been used for surveillance and some of the ones that are a little bit concerning that can make us think uh, so that we can make some decisions in the future. And at the end, we'll wrap up with how you can take control of your personal data and your digital lives. Cool, we're going to look at education. We're in a fantastic environment here today uh, where education is at the pinnacle, I believe. Uh, our future are actually going to be so lucky, uh, our children are going to be so lucky in the future in that they're going to have curated education, you know, tailored services to every one of my needs so I can learn and adapt in my own pace, in my own style, all thanks to great technology. And we're seeing great advances in the number of books digitized, the number of online courses that we have available. So education is available, not to everyone yet, but it will be soon. And we have a look at exploring. We will love to travel. We like to go online and see there's an adventure tour for me. There's a, a healthcare tour for me. At the top of a couple of buttons, we've got something which is tailored to every one of our desires in front of us to keep us entertained. Both of those services, they require a strong profile on you. Your personal data has to be shared to be able to have these future luxuries. Some of them are necessity in the age of rapid education. We're going to need to keep up, so we're going to have to share our personal information. One close to my heart is conservation, uh, coming from Africa. These are poachers in the Maasai Mara in Kenya, actually being tracked by rangers in court using military surveillance technology. I just wish and I hope that uh, the budget allocated to tracking and surveilling wildlife is the same as tracking and surveilling every one of you, then we won't have an extinction problem, I promise you. <laughs> Our animals will be safe. This scarily lovely picture is actually an aeroplane searching over a wildfire in the US, taking thermal scanning images of the fire itself to be able to track its perimeter, 
feed the information to the firefighters so they can plan their defense and to be able to react accordingly and thereby actually saving many, many lives. So great, great technology and great uses that we can see all part of the surveillance world. I don't think any presentation is complete without one of these pictures in <laughs> nowadays, but nobody can deny it's fantastic to be back in the space race, um, especially in a time when te technology is rapidly advancing. And if, especially if an expert tells you it can't be done, then hell yeah, we can do it. In the age of technology, nothing is impossible. And in the future, we're going to have to create an ID system and an identification system for the Mars humans who are going up there and going to live there. So we have to confront these challenges. One of the most compelling changes that we've actually seen in our time is how we communicate. For better or for worse, or as I say, for social revolutions or personal revelations, we've addicted to communication. We're actually a society that's obsessed with content, with communicating every single day, where FOMO is now actually a condition because we don't want to miss out on anything whatsoever. And this desire, however, fuels companies to give us more. We're digitally hungry natives, as they call it. So it pushes them to the limits of what they can do and what they can give to us. So much so, and I have to, sorry, just adopt the pose of a modern social reader, is uh, looking at my phone and read some statistics to you. 70% uh, of social media is spent online on your mobile devices. 200 million people use Instagram per month. Two and a half billion people use messaging apps. 178 million people are active on Snapchat every single day. And if it goes through, 2.07 billion people are active on Facebook. And the one that surprised me the most was 100 million hours of video content is watched on Facebook every day. Now imagine if Monday all the videos were focused on education. You know, we could have a lot of clever people in the world. And if Tuesday was education, 100 million hours on conservation, we would sort out a lot of problems. Wednesday, oceans, how we can clean them up and save them, fantastic. Now this is why we love technology, that we have to be responsible about how we use it. So if we go a little bit leaning into the areas of surveillance capitalism and some of the threats that we have in cybersecurity and some of the concerning areas of technology, Recently, uh, Fox News reporter did a, an interesting uh, article on, on Google. What they did is took two phones um, off, put some cards into them, weren't connected on flat mode, traveled around the city, uh, assuming that nothing was being captured and transmitted, came back, connected the phones up, still off in flat mode, to a nice little device that captured all the data before it went out into the big internet. And what did they see? Every single corner that was taken was tracked. Every location was tracked. Every time they went to a sensitive location, like a, a children's hospital in that case, was tracked. What's more creepy is every time they opened and closed the door, they knew that too. It's in the line of data. They're saying door open, door closed. So this made people very concerned. When I watched it, that it made me think of one of my favorite songs, which is uh, from the police, Every Breath You Take. So uh, let's just have a look at the words. I won't sing because it's horrible. But every break you take and every move you make, every bond you break and every step you take, I'll be watching you. <laughs> the whole new meaning for that song, and I don't think that's what the police meant when they did it. But it gets better. You know, every single day, every word you say, every game you play, and every night you stay, I'll be watching you. And can't you see you belong to me? And that one struck a chord with me. It's like, who do I actually belong to in this digital world? Do I belong to myself or not? I think we as humans have got some significant questions to ask ourselves around are we happy being surveilled 24-7, 365, every single day of our life until we die, possibly even after? I don't think so. Let's have a look at some cool other technologies though, which is part of surveillance. Here, I wasn't aware, um, thanks to National Geographic for great images, best magazine in the world, but Earth is photographed 1.3 million times every day by 133 satellites, and that's from one company. Fantastic uses, but I wasn't aware of this type of scale of monitoring the Earth. It's been used to help predict um, global warming. It's used for next day alerts in the Amazon for deforestation. It's also been used to be able to see mass humanitarian movements of people day by day. It's also been used to find new missile test sites. So 
Are we happy that the whole of humanity is being watched every single day? They can't identify humans from space yet, as far as your face and identify you yet. But are we happy with that speed of change? There's over 1,700 satellites up there, though, and uh, I think all of them are being used for good. But we have to have some sort of control on how we can watch and keep uh, a control of our life when it comes to digitalization. And like I said, there are good in there. I think most people create these technologies with great intentions. However, everyone becomes corruptible at some stage, and there is always somebody who is out there to do something wrong. If we have a look at the next trend, which is around cities. I think a lot of us don't understand how much information there is there. Uh, 2.5 trillion, trillion images are stored on the internet. Billions more are kept on your devices themselves. In one year, 106 million surveillance devices are sold into the marketplace. So actually, it's not only the governments who are watching us for national security, we're watching each other unintentionally, and we're surveilling each other unintentionally. Every time you tag someone, you upload it, everyone knows where they are. Okay, so that's cool, but it's also it could be used for that. So we have to start considering these things. Facebook's latest feature is they can prompt tags now for friends because they've scanned your face and they know who's in your photo, and they can prompt names. It's also quite a cool piece of tech, but if you don't know that person, or if someone comes up and takes a picture of me and my daughter in the park and can identify them because they pretend to be a friend, and I too quickly accepted them because I didn't even look, and then they start spoofing their way into your life, it's a different situation, isn't it? So I think we all have to start thinking twice about what we're going to do about it in the future. Okay, but it's not all bad. Technology is going fast. So the technology of tomorrow is going to give us a lot of strength and a lot of power, but it's also going to make things significantly harder. If we have a look at the speed of artificial intelligence and the latest advances in quantum computing, Actually, cryptographers are quite scared because quantum computing will take that technology away. We'll have to create new ways of guaranteeing digital privacy. So these advances are great for us. Machines are going to help, no doubt, change humanity forever. But on the reverse side, they're also going to be tagging us, watching us, processing us every single microsecond of our lives. Are we happy with that? How do we control it? There will be some great new technologies coming in that will decentralize our information, build trust and transparency in our processes, uh, like blockchain and its future iterations. So we will have tools to be able to combat. But it all comes down to us, the data subject, or Ray, uh, whatever you want to call yourself, on how we are going to manage this in the future. So is it too late for us? Um, personally, I don't think so. If you have a look at the statement over here, uh, our regulators in Europe have actually done a great job in bringing power to us from May this year. You, the individual, can actually start making decisions and be backed by the law to take back your digital freedom. So we have to start making progressive steps on how we're going to do this, find the right tools. But it all starts with the individual. You have to want to stop being lazy and doing something about it and monitoring your life. So there is an action point for you to take away. Uh, being a young adult who lived through some of the apartheid era in South Africa, I got to see the truth and reconciliation that happened in that country. There was a lot of sadness, a lot of anger, a lot of fear. But what was most important was the amount of human ability to forgive. Not to forget, but to forgive. So what I believe we need is a digital truth and reconciliation, which means understanding what companies are doing. So I implore you today to interact with the companies that you are doing business with, that have your data. Talk to them, ask them about the information that they have so that you can be educated and not lazy, not apathetic or ignorant. The next thing is act. Make decisions on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. On, do I like what they're doing with it today? You know, how do I make sure I can take control of it so that we don't lose that element of our life? And finally, hold them to account. We now have the regulation behind us but more importantly, intrinsically, we all want to know that it is our digital life. So once we move into the next steps of our world, which is from a surveillance capitalism into a rapidly advancing artificial intelligent world, where everything is a million times faster, I would like 
to ensure that we are prepared, not as digital slaves, but as digital natives, to be a part of this ecosystem. And to do that, I encourage every one of you to start your long walk to digital freedom with me today. Thank you.